it's the Trappings and Trinkets Knitting Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole. Spring is here. I just saw a daffodil in my backyard. It's like, it's this big. The uh, It's not open. It's just a little white bud, but it's coming. Spring is here. Things are happening. What's happening in your world? Anything interesting? Early March around here is uh, college basketball tournament time. Does your family, do you, do you pick brackets? We've We've picked brackets at our house, not that, like, honestly, like, I always say that Jason, well, that I definitely feel like I was lucky and found the one male my own age who could not care less about most, well, about all sports. <laughs> um, he doesn't, he doesn't have a team, he doesn't have a sport. Like, we, we cut the cable cord probably 10 years ago, and the thing that made it really easy for us was that there is... We have no loyalty to any sort of sport. I know a lot of families are like, oh, I would love to get rid of cable, but you can't get the the Cubs games on the on Netflix or Hulu, or you know, you can't get the basketball games that we like to watch. We don't care. <laughs> At the Montgomery House, we could not care less. Um, but in March, we do actually watch some college basketball. I think it's I think it rubbed off from my dad. He's a he's a basketball fan. So um, my son has kind of been indoctrinated in the we watch college basketball. Although this year my son did not pick a bracket. It was just my daughter and my husband that picked brackets. So maybe my son couldn't care less either. So it wouldn't surprise me. He definitely he would have come into that honestly if he doesn't care. Uh, but we were watching some basketball games this weekend, and I did enjoy the the um, story about the number 16 ranked team that beat a number one seed. <laughs> I bet it was a tense locker room in that, uh, was it Virginia? Virginia locker room? Yeah, that team probably wasn't feeling so great, and I'm sure the coach wasn't real happy, but just goes to show, you never know what ha what'll happen. So don't walk in there too cocky. <laughs> um... Speaking of college, my son got a uh, little packet from the college he's going to go to next fall um, in the mail this week, and uh, I was really, I was, I was, um, I was really happy to see they are doing like a summer reading book that they tell all the incoming freshmen to read, and then they use it as kind of sounds like as kind of a icebreaker um, kind of intro to how we expect you could to contribute and speak respectfully to other people. Um, they chose a book that will be controversial. It's a, it, a book that is about a topic that is definitely in the zeitgeist right now. And, you know, uh, we're in central Illinois. So that is an area that um, has a lot of people that are, that would call themselves conservative. Um, it, also, this college draws a lot from the Chicago area, so they also have a lot of people that probably would consider them, themselves more progressive. And so I thought it was really smart of this college to choose a book that's going to be controversial, that people coming from all the areas of the state and around the Midwest and you know beyond that, um, people are going to have really different opinions about the topic that is addressed in this book. And I love that they decided to use that as like, now you're at college, you can have your opinions, because I went to this college, so I know what the what the culture is there. And it really is a, you can have whatever opinion you have, but you need to back it up. You need to be able to um, articulate it calmly and respectfully. You need to be able to take in the opinions of others and kind of you know, figure out what you think about that. You have to see if somebody else's opinion can kind of fit into your worldview or if you're going to allow that to um, change your perspective. So I thought that was pretty genius. I, I wish that all colleges did that. <laughs> this was not something, they didn't do this when uh, my husband and I both graduated from this college. So they didn't do that when we were in college. Um, but especially just considering the public discourse and how maybe it is um, not as respectful, not as well thought out as it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, I think that was 
that's pretty smart to just right out of the gate show the kids like this is what we expect. So um, they also have started a thing where the freshmen go to school about a week before the upperclassmen and that week is used to meet with your counselor, kind of get situated in your dorm. They go and do service projects in the community and it's just kind of a week to acclimate, you know, meet other people in your class so that it's not like you're moving in on a Sunday and then Monday or Tuesday you're in class and you're still kind of like, I don't even know where the cafeteria is. <laughs> so they do give the freshmen a little bit longer um, to figure out what's going on. And also, I like that they are putting them out in the community. They're putting them in small groups to do work projects. I think that really helps facilitate relationships and get them talking to each other and working together. So I thought that was good, too. I'm really happy with, with the way things are going so far. <laughs> As far as my life is concerned, one of my projects in March was to get my business taxes. I, I get my paperwork all together where I kind of collect because I sell things on various platforms. Um, so I kind of have to collect all that information and put it into a spreadsheet so that my husband, the accountant, can... I'm sorry, my cat is like... I don't know what his problem is. He is really... He really wants to talk about whatever's happening out the window. I think it's bird related. Uh, so anyway, uh, my husband, the accountant, comes along. And before you think, oh, he's an accountant, he's great at taxes, he's not a tax accountant. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, he can he does the taxes, but he does them with like turbo tax. <laughs> you know, it's, he does it the same way that people who aren't accountants do it. Um, so I get my stuff together and then I hand it off to him and he does the, the, all the taxes, the family taxes. So I was going to show you because this took me a little extra time. I did some looking on the internet, um, decided that there really wasn't anything out there to show you how to find this information. Um, and then I finally ended up calling or calling or maybe I was doing some kind of like computer chat to ask the Etsy people, how do you find out what your sales were using Etsy payments? Um, if you have an Etsy shop, you probably remember that sometime in 2017, I want to say it was like summer, maybe June, July, Etsy required sellers to use Etsy payments. Um, you can use it as a choice or you can use it exclusively. I have had no trouble with Etsy payments. Like it's, it's fine. It's, um, I'm not, I don't know that it's cheaper than PayPal. It's pretty comparable. So I, I wouldn't highly recommend one over the other. Um, but the, there is an extra step, a few extra steps actually, when it comes to your taxes, because it used to be that all, even though I sold on different platforms, all of the financial stuff went through PayPal. And so when it was tax time, all I had to do was go to PayPal, find my tax document, download that, done. So now there's another few steps when it comes to integrating the Etsy payments business into my taxes. So if you are an Etsy seller and you want to know how to figure out what your sales were on Etsy, I have this little quick video to show you. If you are an Etsy seller, you might be looking for uh, payment information so that you can do your taxes this spring, in the United States anyway. Um, so if you are looking for that information, let me show you how to get there because it is definitely not intuitive. Um, so first you need to pull up your dashboard and this is just like the page that shows stats on your shop. And over here on the side, there's different tabs, and yes, it would totally make sense for tax information to be under the Finances tab, but it is not. Go on down to Settings. That's where they hit it. <laughs> and then once you hit Settings, then you're going to go up to the Options tab, and that will bring up this page. And then you're going to choose Download Data, and then here's the last little bit of uh, confusion. Well, not confusion, just it, it could be handled better. Um, so you're going to select, probably for tax purposes, you want to know what your sales were that were run through your Etsy payments because, you know, some of your payments may still be going through PayPal and you can get that tax information on the PayPal website. So to do the Etsy payment sales, you have to select that 
And then you go on down here where you then have to do each month for the tax year that you're looking at. Um, they don't have an option yet to just do an entire year or to do a, a range of dates like January through December. Um, so you have to do it for every single month. So when you hit download for my computer, then that file just jumps into your download folder. And then once the download file is in your downloads folder, then you can access that information. So that's how you do it. So hopefully that made sense. Shall we talk about knitting? Let's talk about knitting. So knitting number one is of this lovely new sweater. Whoop, there we go. All right, it's just a brown pullover. I'll put a nice little picture in here so that you can see the full, full length view of it. Um, but I was really happy with how this turned out. It really, it fits great. It's um, a circular yoke. So that just means that the increases are evenly distributed. Um, so that it starts small at the collar and it gets bigger, bigger, bigger until you split off the arms and then you just keep going on the body. So I was really thrilled. I wasn't knitting to gauge because I never do. <laughs> Even when I try to, I never do. So it was fine though. I just, I gauge swatched and I decided that my gauge compared to the pattern gauge was a little bit larger. So my stitches were a little bit larger. And so I decided I would just do a size smaller than what I actually wanted. And I did the math and I figured out it was going to be about right. So I think I did a size 39, which is actually my bust size. But I wanted this sweater to have a little bit of positive ease. I didn't want it to be real clingy. So I think the sweater turned out to be around 42 inches. So I've got about three inches of positive ease there. And really, I think it, it fits really nicely. Now, the thing that I have not done yet is my little blips of color. And I think I am going to do that. I just haven't done it yet. And I really wanted to show this <laughs> in the podcast. So here it is. I wore it this weekend too, just brown and white. And it was lovely. So it, I really do like it like this. I wouldn't necessarily have to put the little blips of color, but I have the yarn to do it. I think it would be a, a fun thing to do. So I think I will put the little buds in there. So real happy with that. The pattern was called Branches and bu uh, Buds. And I want to say it was that Carrie Bostic Hogue or Hoge, something like that. I'll put her name. Here's the person that wrote this pattern. <laughs> Really well written pattern. Um, the only thing that was maybe slightly lacking was because I was very curious, like exactly how am I supposed to put those buds on there? Because I was thinking it was duplicate stitch, and then I decided it kind of looks more like satin stitch, and then thought, well, I'll just read the pattern and they'll tell me what it is. They don't. But the pattern says something like, and when you're done, you can add little blips of color <laughs> or something. She doesn't call them blips, but basically it's like, and now add your color. The end. <laughs> so I think I will try some sort of just little satin stitch um, and I'll let you know how that works if it was uh, successful. So real happy with that. Um, did I modify it? I think I did a little bit. I like arms that fit me and apparently I have long gorilla arms because arms of store store-bought shirts are always a little bit on the short side so I made these arms so that they touch my hand they slightly go over my hand and I don't remember what the pattern said for the cuff like how long the ribbing on the cuff was supposed to be I decided that I wanted it this long <laughs> so that's what I did and this was probably about maybe a third or a half of the length of the ribbing on the, like there's the ribbing on the bottom of the sweater and here's the ribbing on the cuff. So it was eh, maybe about half of that. I actually wanted it to be in between the skinny ribbon ribbing on the neck and the thicker, taller ribbing on the hem. That was my idea. I also didn't do as many decreases on these sleeves. like. This, the pattern would have wanted this to fit a little closer at the wrist, but I kind of liked it as a little bit more of a loose sleeve. So personal preference. I think that's the only, um, that's the only modifications that I did though. Everything else 
I like the way it looked. I like the way it fit. So I just went with it. I also found my fifth skein of yarn. Were you watching my drama unfold on Instagram? <laughs> I So I went to, to skein up. Like I, I had been working with one skein of the brown yarn. Oh, this is Sandbark, by the way. Arroyo, uh, Malabrigo Arroyo yarn. And it was Sandbark. And then the white was just called Natural, I think. So I had five skeins of Sandbark. And I had been working with the first skein. And I was, you know, about... 30 rows into the yoke and I thought well I'll skein up the or I'll cake up the rest of that yarn so that it's just ready to roll because this is going pretty fast. So I um, got the first one caked up and then I untwisted the second skein. Hold on I'll show you. So I untwisted the second skein. Here it is. The offending skein. Let me see if I can find it. Ha! Found it. Okay. So I untwisted this and then I saw this spot. Can you see that? It's like really bright yellowish mustard, like a little bit of green in there. And this whole area, I mean, that is touching probably 20 different strands. Like this, it's not like this was something that was just contained to one little area. It's this weird color that really, like, it shows up very well on the, against the natural brown. Um, so I didn't want that on my sweater because it would just, it would be like one yellow, bright yellow green spot here and then one yellow bright green spot over here. It would have been all around the body, just very, it wouldn't have been like speckles. It would have been like mistakes. It would have been like, oh, what did she spill on herself? So I was so disappointed. And honestly, like, so I did buy this. Um, I There's a couple yarn shops that if I'm looking for yarn that they don't have at my local yarn shop, I will shop at a few other local yarn shops that just aren't local to me. So I'll have them ship the yarn. So if I had been there in person and bought this yarn, I'm not sure I would have seen that stain because it wasn't visible from the outside. It, you know, when it was all wrapped up like this, it was like it was on the inside. So, you know, I would have made the same mistake. I don't blame the people that sent it to me. But it is frustrating because, you know, you buy a sweater's quantity of yarn in a certain colorway and I bought this back in February. So it's not like that colorway exists you know, in any shop by this point. So I was really frustrated that that happened. So I think, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious that what happened was either, it either got splashed with some dye or some dye was on a surface and it got soaked up by this yarn, or maybe there was another skein of yarn that was that yellowish green color and it was touching this skein while they were both still wet. I don't know exactly what happened, but come on now, quality control. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I got really lucky because I did find, oh, so anyway, so the story was that I could only find four of my five skeins. So I'm like, ah, great. Like, I know I can't get a sweater out of three skeins and I have this one that I can't really use for the sweater. So I was desperate to find that fourth skein and I wandered around the house for about an hour and looked everywhere and couldn't find it. And that's when I was posting on Instagram, like, I can't find my fifth skein. I know it's around here somewhere. And then I got off of Instagram and five minutes later I remembered where I had put it and it was actually it was in a place that I had already looked but I apparently didn't look very well <laughs> so I found my fifth skein so I was very lucky it did only take four skeins I wonder if I have my leftovers here yep I do so this is my leftover yarn so what is that 20% of a skein or something. Um, so it took about three full skeins plus maybe 75, 80% of the last skein. And I didn't need that weird skein that had the stains on it. So that was nice. Along with this color work sweater, because I don't know, I think that um, if you are a skilled crafter, I think that the inside of your work is just looks just as nice as the outside of your work. So I do take pride in the fact that my floats look nice and uh, 
uniform. So I was going to show you. Here's how I do that. So when I do color work, I like to hold it um, with my left hand doing continental and my right hand doing English style. And then I like to work right at the tips of my needles with my stitches kind of stretched out. And the reason I do this is because I don't want my floats to be tight in the back because that will make your fabric um, pucker. So I'll do a few stitches and then as I move it onto the right needle, I again just make sure that my stitches are not puckering and they're nicely spaced out. I always hold my um, the yarn that I'm doing more stitches in my left hand because that is the style I normally knit. So my, uh, my yarn that I'm using more is in my left hand and my yarn that I'm using less is in my right hand. And as you can see, I just don't let my stitches bunch up together as I'm knitting them. I keep them nicely spaced out and I keep checking every, I would say probably every 10 or so stitches, I just check them to make sure I haven't pulled any of my floats too tight. And that's really all there is to it. Just keep it loose. And that will give you some nice floats that will uh, allow your fabric to lay flat. So you should give a color work project a try. It's really, it's not difficult. It's just, it's a little bit slower than regular knitting. So you do have to keep checking to make sure everything is spread out and not pulling, but also not too loose. So there is some patience required in that, but not really, I, I it's hard for me to call it skill. Like it's really just patience and checking and double checking and making sure that you're not making things too tight or making things real loose and sloppy. So speaking of color work though, like that is the theme this week. <laughs> I apparently have uh, decided that it's color work all day, every day. So I have this hat. So I've got a little logo on the front. I'm not going to show it to you though. That, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> It's just, it's just not entirely legal. So we're just going to keep it to ourselves. This is a gift. I'm just making one for one special person. So as much as I, I do really, you know, respect copyright and trademark and all that kind of stuff, I would never sell anything like this. Um, I would never make a pattern for anything like this. But this is a special situation where there's someone that who I really wanted to do something special for. And so I asked this person's mom, like, what kind of things he was into, and she gave me an idea um, and, like, a logo that he might like to wear, and so I am totally making him that thing. Anyway, <laughs> so this logo has three colors in it, and so I didn't want to do um, Intarsia because... Intarsia sometimes looks kind of messy, and a lot of these lines on this logo are just single stitches, like just one column of stitches, or just one row of stitches. And so the, the less rows and columns that are together of a color, I feel like the more potential there is for the, it just to look like a disaster. So I didn't want to do intarsia. Um, I decided to do a double knitting technique that I learned from a pattern called It's Not About the Hat. And I will link that on the show notes because it was a really, it, it was a very eye-opening experience. <laughs> so to do color work, you can either do stranded, you can do double knitting, or you can do intarsia. Those are pretty much like the, that's your three choices, the standard three choices. So this pattern, It's Not About the Hat, actually teaches a new technique is it new? I think it's new. The person writing the pattern said, like, I think I made this up. Certainly, like, there's no, you know, there I say, like, there's nothing new in knitting. That's probably true. Probably someone has figured this out. But this is the first person that I'm aware of that went to the trouble to, like, write this down and actually show you how to do it. Um, she, I think, if I remember correctly, she said that she saw the pattern on a commercially made sweater and then kind of figured out how to do that. So it's really cool because um, the pattern 
Well, so I just did like a uh, fold over brim. So that's a double sided. Um, it's just a double sided stockinette brim that I folded, did a little knit two together row, and then I continued up with the hat. But what I did was when it comes to that knit two together row, so the knit two together row was the second to last <laughs> green row, I think, yeah. Um, so the last green row, I treated it like double knitting. So that means I would do a knit stitch and then instead of working the next stitch on my left needle, I would go into the horizontal bar and I would do a purl stitch with a second strand of yarn. So I was using two different strands of green yarn. The first one was to knit every stitch that was already on my needle. And the second strand was to create every other stitch was going to be a new stitch and it was going to be done as a purl. And so what that does, this will make sense if you've ever double knit. If you've never double knit before, you're probably like, I have no idea what she's talking about. And that's okay. Go learn how to double knit. <laughs> you don't want to try this until you understand double knitting. Um, but if you understand double knitting, so now I've done a setup row and now I am working as if I'm double knitting. So I have here two layers. One layer is mostly green. Whoop mostly green with the logo on the front. And then the other layer is mostly yellow and gray as alternating pretty much. Um, when it comes to the area with the logo, there is some green mixed in there because sometimes when the yellow or the gray is showing on the front side, that means I had to use the green for the back side. So, um, because this hat uses three colors, um, I was pretty much alternating the two colors that weren't green, like the main color of the hat. I was alternating those on the inside. And then the green, mostly, was the outside color. So this is turning out really nicely. What am I using here? Oh, this is all um, Wonderland Yarns Mad Hatter yarn. So it's a super wash wool. So that means it's going to be pretty soft. It's going to be washable. It's, it's going to be good hat yarn. It strikes a good balance between comfortable and sturdy slash, you know, nice stiff, de nice stitch definition. Uh, just a really nice yarn. So, so that's that. Special hat for a special kid. And then my last, <laughs> my last project here is this. It's called the Meowf hat. I don't know. What does Meowf mean? I don't know what that means. Maybe someone's cat is uh, Meowf. Meowf. Is that a French, French cat? Meowf. So this pattern is intarsia. Intarsia requires 7,382 strands. Seriously, like, I am not real OCD about anything, but intarsia just about crushes my spirit. <laughs> what? Oh, intarsia, you're killing me. So, the thing about intarsia is that you have to have a new strand for every color change. So that means I have a strand of purple for this, then a strand of white, then a strand of purple, then a strand of black, then a strand of purple, then a strand of white, then purple, black, purple, white, purple, black, and purple. Oh my gosh. What is that? Like 14 strands? <laughs> so the only thing that is keeping me from jumping off the out the window is that this only lasts for, I don't know, maybe 20 rows. Like it, it really doesn't last that long. So basically it's a sort of thing where normally I would start it at a time where I can just sit in a chair, do those 20 rows without getting up. And then like when it's all done, cut those extra strands and then continue with the part of the hat that is not so crazy. Um, but it just so happened that the timing didn't work out that way for me today. So I had to stop here after about 
10 rows, but it's going fine. So these are the butts of cats <laughs> that you see here so far. I actually really liked the colors they chose for the sample hat. Um, I'm not sure you can see on camera, but the, the lower part of this hat actually is like a real deep plum color. Um, and the cats are black and white. There's some gray towards the top. And then there's also some little white snow sprinkle. I think it's supposed to be snow. That's what it looks like to me. So anyway, I've got like uh, two thirds of the cat butts done and I'm well on my way for my meow hat. So the meow hat and my sweater are both part of my make nine. Do you have a make nine for 2018? So if you're not, I is this just an Instagram thing? That's the only place I've seen it. Um, there's a hashtag that's just hashtag make nine and people are creating little photo collages of things that they might like to make this year or things that like that's their goal is to make these nine things in 2018. So my make nine. So let's talk about it, shall we? Let's start in the upper left corner there. So there's the branches and buds sweater with that little bunny and see hers looks nice with those color dots. So I want to be just like her. <laughs> I'll put my color dots on too. Okay, so in the top center there, that is a shawl, and I want to say it was called Bernstein. Not 100% sure on that. I'll, I'll put the names of these things up on the screen, too. Um, the top right, that hat was called the Hamel Knit. <laughs> That's definitely copyright infringement, uh, but I'm totally going to knit it. So... I think that people think that if they're not making money off of something that they can go ahead and use someone else's material. Um, that's not true. So uh, at the same time, like, that's cool. I, I like Hamilton stuff. I like Hamilton. So, and I apparently am obsessed with um, color work this year. So it's the year of color work. So anyway, Hamel knit doing that. Below the Hamel knit is a pair of leggings. I think I talked about that on a previous podcast. I want to make a couple pairs of knit leggings, not hand knit, just like knit fabric. So I have a combination platter here. I have a uh, knitting and sewing make nine. Underneath the leggings, that pattern is called the Snowbell Trapper Hat, and it's a crochet pattern. It's one that I've had in my queue for quite a while and I just haven't made it yet. Um, I'm, a, I'm a novice crocheter. I can crochet a little bit. Like I know how to do the stitches. I'm just not super comfortable. <laughs> I'm just not super confident about it. And um, gauge is definitely still a challenge for me with crochet because I'm not consistent about how I hold the yarn and how I use the hook. So crochet can be hit or miss. For me and you know that's definitely something I would like to get better at so that is on my list for this year center bottom that's the meow hat um, the sweater on the bottom left I'll put the name of that here because it's it's uh, slipping my mind right now but that's a fun just a fun raglan zip up pullover that I would like to make I don't have yarn for that one yet so that might be sometime later in the year um, there is a pair of Colorwork socks above that, and I'll put that name up on the screen too. I like the use of the color changing yarn along with the black yarn. I'm not sure I would keep um, a contrasting heel and cuff and toe. I might just do all black with some sort of color changing yarn for the flowers and the little graphic design. We'll see. And right in the center there is one that I've already completed, and that was the sewn sweatshirt that I made um, that I showed you in the last episode. So that is my Make 9 for 2018. Do you have a Make 9? I would like to see it. Put your Make 9 in, I'm going to open a thread in my Ravelry group. I want to see what your Make 9 is. So I'll put mine uh, just I'll just put a picture of it up in the Ravelry group, and I want to see what yours is. So, and if you can't upload, well, you could it. You could put that Make Nine picture as a picture in one of your project pages, like 
maybe you are already working on one of those projects or maybe you finished it. So put your Make 9 as a photo in one of your project pages and that will allow you to, put, uh, to share it in the group thread. So how about that? Mm -hmm. All right. I think that's about it for this week. I've shown you all my knitting and told you all my stories. <laughs> So I hope you are having a wonderful week and I hope that you find some color work projects to work on because I am quite enjoying all my color work. I've got the, the stranded, I have the double knitted green hat and I have the intarsia cats. That's like the trifecta of color work. When, when does that ever happen? That you're working on all three different kinds? Never. That's never it's never been done. Just now. Uh, so I hope that you find some sort of color work fun for yourself and that you uh, show me what you're working on. I hope you have a wonderful couple of weeks and I will see you later.